I recently had a friend who was pregnant and excitingly she was within days of giving birth. Throughout the evening when our family spent time together, I could see the struggle and discomfort that she was going through. And it caused me to remember my wife when she was pregnant. And I imagined uh, the discomfort that she was having. It caused this compassion to well up within me to do anything I could do to help. If you saw a woman like this, especially one that was full term and ready to give birth, you would probably give up your seat for her or open a door or even do something so she wouldn't have to get up. But that's not what Mary faced when she walked into Bethlehem after her long, strenuous journey from Nazareth. So you might wonder why she would make a journey like this when she was ready to give birth. When she was full term with Jesus, the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus decreed a census that required all the Israelites to return to their hometown. And so Mary and her fiance Joseph packed up and headed the 90 mile, seven to 10 day journey on foot from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now 90 miles is a strenuous journey for anyone, let alone Mary who was nine months pregnant. But she trusted the Holy Spirit when he came and told her that she was carrying the Messiah. So she was committed to whatever it would take to deliver the one who would overcome all the discomfort and the discouragement she would face along the way. When they arrived in Bethlehem after their long journey, you can imagine how nice it would have been to have a nice hot shower, have a nice comfy bed, and even have one of Joseph's relatives cook you a nice warm meal. But that's not what happened. As they entered into Joseph's hometown, none of his relatives opened their homes, as was the custom for that day. So they went from inn to inn and everything was taken. See, the reputation that Mary had developed being pregnant prior to marriage had caused Mary and Joseph to be outcasts. The people who should have had compassion on their situation have rejected them. Not only did their family reject them, but everyone who lived in Bethlehem had cast them out to fend for themselves. Rather than finding someone willing to give up their room for a full-term pregnant woman, they had to make their way to a farm that had a barn they could stay in. And to clarify, this is not some barn dominium that you'd see on HGTV, a place that you'd want to go and take your family for your yearly Christmas photo. This is an old animal barn, a place that Luke shares with us the only reason animals weren't at is because the shepherds had taken them to the fields to feed. And this animal barn would have been everything you can imagine an animal barn to be. The smell of manure, the bugs, no heating or air conditioning, no running water, no bathroom, no beds. If you wanted to sleep, you'd have to sleep on the itchy pokey straw. After seven days of dirt road hiking and roadside tent camping, they were treated as outcasts with hostility and inhospitality by Joseph's very own relatives. These are not only Joseph's relatives, but they're God's people. So you can imagine the thoughts that Satan is tempting Mary and Joseph with about their value and purpose. Thoughts like, if not even our family, who are God's people will accept us, then we must be worthless. But these labels and insecurities that Mary and Joseph would have been tempted to have and the judgmental responses that those living in Bethlehem would have had are exactly what Jesus came to overcome. While the world looks at Mary and Joseph as outcasts who deserve to be rejected, God looks at them as lovable and valuable. Just like Samuel teaches when he says that God doesn't look at the outward appearance of man, but he looks at the heart. And that's why Mary was chosen, because of her righteous heart. We see this when Gabriel appears to Mary and says, Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. When Gabriel shares these things with Mary, at first she's confused and even resistant to what God believes about her. The labels and insecurities that she and the world have put on her have caused her to question what's true about her. But not only does God not see the labels and insecurities, he overlooks her sin too, because that's exactly what he came to overcome. We see in Romans 5, it says, For we know how dearly God loves us. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. For God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Maybe you feel like Mary or Joseph, an outcast, overlooked by those who should care for you. Or maybe you feel like an outsider, somebody that should find somewhere else to be. Maybe you even feel this way when you come to church. You feel like those around you would shun you if they knew the things you've done. 
But these shortcomings are exactly why Jesus came in the flesh. He overcame the insecurities that were brought on by sin. He erased all the boundaries that culture uses to separate the good enoughs from the unworthy. He overcame it all. Luke shows that through Jesus' birth that he overcame for the outcast, like his parents. The overlooked, like the shepherds, who were the first to know about his birth. And the outsider, the magi, who were led by a star to Jesus by God. Each of these people was created in the image of God, yet no good Jew would associate with them. But God found favor with them. He loved them, he chose them, and he even used them. But that's not all. He didn't just come to overcome these social boundaries. He came to overcome sin of all mankind. We see in Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus came to overcome many things, but most importantly, man's sin. He did this when he sacrificed his life on the cross. Individually, we receive this forgiveness when we believe that Jesus sacrificed his life for us. But this belief is not just something we agree with and then go on living our life like we did before. When we experience the overcomer like Mary did, then we respond like Mary did. It says, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said to me come true. When we believe that Jesus sacrificed his life for us, then we become his servant and we live our life to fulfill his will. This Christmas, if you don't believe that Jesus sacrificed his life to overcome for your sins, that he came to overcome for every fear, insecurity, doubt, addiction, and shortcoming so that you could be welcomed into his family, then I challenge you to examine why not? What causes you to question and doubt his sacrifice? If you have questions and doubts, don't let them go unanswered. Let us know. We'd love to help in any way that we can. Don't wait to cry out to God, your creator, for salvation. If you do believe, remember that Jesus is the overcomer. He overcame every weakness, fear, insecurity, doubt, addiction, and shortcoming. He doesn't see weakness and guilt or shame. You are free from sin and the labels that it's placed on you. The questions to ask yourself are, are you committed to the Lord's will like Mary was? Do you believe about yourself the same things that God believes about you? And do you welcome in all to hear the gospel of Jesus, even those who are considered outcasts? Jesus is the overcomer for all sins. 2 Corinthians 10 says, We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. That's what we're called to do. This Christmas, let's destroy every insecurity and label that has come from sin so that we can share the freedom that comes in Christ.